We are live. Welcome back to the nuclear, No Nuclear Forum, a series of 12 workshops focusing on nuclear power, nuclear waste, and nuclear weapons, all aspects that impact the Great Lakes Basin and impact the world. Uh, we have to be here in the Great Lakes Basin, so we'll use these cases as examples. But if you've got other examples of nuclear reactors around the world, uh, they will be brought forward as well. Um, we're going to lead off with uh, Angela Bischoff. She's with the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, and she will be presenting on the Canadian nuclear plants, most of which are concentrated on, in Ontario. Uh, then we'll move to Kevin Camps with Nuclear Information Resource Services. He'll be covering U.S. reactors and probably draw on examples of, in the Great Lakes Basin. And then we'll move to Arnie Gunderson, who will give a world perspective. And what would happen if there were an accident in the Great Lakes Basin of any one of these 35 to 60 nuclear reactors that would impact the basin? So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Angela Bishop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I am going to give a very brief overview of the Canadian nuclear scene. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to give a much more detailed PowerPoint presentation. But for today, just a general overview. How many of you live in Canada? Okay, good. Half of you. So I'll be curious to see how much of this you already know or how much of it is new. So Canada, Ontario in particular, I'm going to focus on, well, in terms of nuclear reactors in Canada, Ontario has built 22 CANDU reactors, Quebec built two CANDU reactors, and New Brunswick built one reactor, is that right, Kevin? Or two? Yeah. One. Of which they rebuilt the, the New Brunswick reactor, so it was old. Candies are designed for about a 30-year lifespan. So when, when the candy reactor in New Brunswick came to that time frame, they rebuilt it. They spent a few billion dollars rebuilding it. It came in a few billion dollars over budget, which they always do. When it was time to rebuild the Quebec reactors, they said, no, we're going to shut them down. So Quebec had shut down their reactors. Ontario is a different story. So Ontario has 22 reactors, of which two have been shut down over time. So we have 18 working reactors. That means we are the second most nuclearized jurisdiction in the world, Ontario. Second only to France. France gets about 75% of their electricity from nuclear power. Ontario gets 60% of our electricity from nuclear power. And globally speaking, I think it's about 13% of the electricity in the world comes from nuclear power. Is that right, Kevin? And going down, it's more like 11 now. Okay, and it's going down. So it's already peaked. Because all the reactors, most of the reactors were built pre-Chernobyl. And Chernobyl was 1986. And after the Chernobyl explosion blew, the world realized what we were in for. And so they started, for the most part, or they stopped building new reactors. Some have been built since, but very few. That was the peak. Then, and since then, reactors are now starting to shut down. Uh, Arnie is going to speak more about the global situation. But in Canada, we built all our reactors pre-Chernobyl. Some of them came online after Chernobyl, but that's because they were already in the works. So in Ontario, 18 working reactors. Just on the border of Toronto, the eastern border of Toronto, and as you know, Toronto is on the northwest corner of Lake Ontario. Five kilometers east of Toronto was the first nuclear station built, eight reactors at this town of Pickering. It's right on the waterfront. Uh, eight reactors, of which two have since been shut down, six reactors, they're now upwards of 45 years old. They've had some couple of hundred million dollars to tweak and upgrade over time. But for the most part, that station is now 45 years old. Keep in mind, designed to last 30 years. Uh, 
um, OPG uh, is proposing to keep the plant open for another 12 years, at which point the station will be 57 years old. There's no opposition in the legislature to that, by the way. The NDP haven't opposed it because they're beholden to the unions. The Conservatives haven't opposed it because they're essentially a pro-nuclear party because they represent all the nuclear ridings in the province. And the Liberals are just it's easier to go with the status quo. And the, the media aren't really opposing it because they get huge ad, ad revenues from the nuclear industry. So it's just moving ahead. They've, already, they've gotten several extensions. They were supposed to close in 2007, got an extension until 2013, then 2018. Now they're asking for an extension until 2028. We're calling for the closure of the Pickering Nuclear Station in 2018 when its current license expires. Um, it's the oldest Canadian station. It's one of, it's, it's the, it's one of the oldest in the world. The first reactor came into being, the first nuclear reactor for electricity purposes was uh, came into operation in 69. I think it's the, we're the fifth oldest plant in the world, station in the world. Yeah. Um, and it's the, it's the, um, it's also one of the largest stations in the world with eight reactors. And it has no cooling towers. Any of the American stations, is it all of the American no. stations? Okay, so most nuclear stations in the world have cooling towers. You know that typical image of a reactor that looks like that? That's called, the, that's the cooling tower where the water circulates around to keep the fuel rods cool. But Canada decided that we wouldn't force the industry to make, to build them, which essentially protects the lake water. Uh, to save money, so the industry could save money. Also, the local communities didn't really want the cooling towers because they're tall and they're bad PR. So instead of building the cooling towers, they built some mounds of soil to hide the nuclear station. When you're driving on the highway, you don't even see it. So that's the Pickering station. Um, then further, about 20 kilometers further east, of the Pickering Station, again, right on Lake Ontario, is the Darlington Nuclear Station. And that's Canada's newest station. It came in online in the late 80s and early 90s. It has four nuclear reactors. They're all 30 years old now. Come to, they've come to the end of their lives. And interestingly, they're the, the most, they came online in the late early 80s, early 90s, and they're already starting to rebuild it. Starting this year, they're starting to rebuild. But the Pickering Station, they're just running to the ground. So the, the Darlington Station, they're, 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 they're claiming to invest about $12 billion to rebuild those all four reactors. We know that every nuclear station in Ontario's history has gone over budget on average by 2.5 times. So if we take that 2.5 times the 12 billion that OPG, which is the provincial owned utility, that 12 billion will actually be closer to 30 billion dollars. What could we do with that 30 billion dollars in terms of renewable energy? So that's the four stations. They've already gotten approval. They're starting to build those four reactors. Then on Kincardine, so on Lake Huron, which is northwest of Toronto is the town of Kincardine. And there is a, the, the world's largest nuclear station there. It's called Bruce Nuclear Station. It was originally built by OPG or by our provincial utility. And now we're renting, we still own it. We own the, the waste, we own the liability if there's an accident, but we don't own the profits. So the management of the plant is run by a private consortium called Bruce Power, Bruce Nuclear Power. And uh, they have already rebuilt two of their eight reactors. And now we've signed a contract with them to rebuild all six of the rest, locking us into nuclear essentially for another four decades. This is the largest private sector contract ever in the history of Ontario. No public oversight, it was behind closed doors, 
contract. It will cost the consumers and ratepayers of Ontario 60 to $111 billion. No public oversight. So that's the situation in Ontario. Um, we still think that we can, you know, cancel the extension of the Pickering Nuclear Station, cancel the rebuilds of Darlington and the rebuilds of Bruce. We're confident that as an anti-nuclear movement, we're making huge headway in challenging all of those contracts. None of the shovels are in the ground yet for any of those rebuilds. And what we're proposing as a community to replace, well, so that in terms of the order, the first one is to extend Pickering, so that, that can be closed at any point, right? But the second is the rebuilding of the nuclear, or of the Darlington station uh, of the four reactors. And um, we're proposing, rather than rebuild those nuclear reactors, to import water power from Quebec. So Quebec has massive excess electricity that they don't have a market for. They're selling some of it to the Midwest, US, but they don't have the transmission lines down there. They only have two long-term contracts to Vermont and two long-term contracts to Cornwall, Ontario. And the bulk of their electricity, 80 plus percent, is sold at uh, on the spot market, which is, I'll just throw this number out, around three cents a kilowatt hour. So that's really rock bottom prices. By comparison, the rebuilding of Darlington, OPG says, which is the provincial utility, that that $12 billion I mentioned earlier translates to around eight cents a kilowatt hour. So versus Quebec is selling the bulk of its hydro, electricity, its water power at three cents. So, and if we look at how much Darlington will actually cost, it's closer to 15 cents a kilowatt hour versus three cents what Quebec is selling water power. So we're saying if we went somewhere in between, their long-term contracts have been around six cents a kilowatt hour. If we purchased, we already have the electricity grid between the provinces and would only require sort of a, a, a minimal upgrade of the interties. So instead of rebuilding Darlington, import water power from Quebec, we would save Ontario consumers and repairs around $12 billion, at least. Then if we're looking at cost overruns, we're going way higher than that, like $20 billion. So saving money, lowering our carbon footprint, being a good neighbor to Quebec, renewable electricity, much safer, no liability concerns, no risking the Great Lakes waters. Uh, and then, then we have Bruce. So we've got the Darlington reactors could all be replaced in a moment with water power from Quebec. They're excess, but they don't have a market for it. So then there's the Bruce nuclear station, which, as I mentioned, the largest station in the world, just signed a contract with them. They're going to start in the next they, uh, they won't actually get shovels into the ground for till 2021, I think. So we still have a couple of years to, to, knock, to knock this project off. Whoops. Okay. Uh, so we're saying, okay, water power from Quebec, made in Ontario, renewable energy, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, biogas. The whole world is going renewable. Ontario has this uh, you know, gem of an opportunity to be, we could, we could go 100% renewable by 2030. That's what we're calling for. Let the stations shut down as they come to the end of their lives in the next decade, because each of those stations comes to the end of its life in the next decade. Replace them with renewable electricity. It's much cheaper. All of those options, even solar now, in the States, they're purchasing sol large solar contracts at three cents a kilowatt hour. Or maybe not in the States yet at three cents, but in Saudi Arabia they did massive, no, Kuwait, I forget. Sorry, I keep looking at you, Kevin. It was maybe Saudi Arabia, massive solar project at three cents. So renewables are here now. Meanwhile, the costs of nuclear power are going up and up with, with increased need for security, et cetera. So um, that's what we're advocating for. 
We, I just have a, a, a couple of things to hand out here. I have some CDs at the back if you're interested. Um, this is my little commercial pitch on uh, nuclear power and green energy. They're German films. Um, and they're just, I pirated them. I have some leaflets here, just grab one. And um, if you sign the petition to close Pickering, you'll be added to our email list automatically. Uh, but I also have a, a newsletter called No Nukes News. If you want to receive that, it goes out every 10 days and it lists the global, the Ontario, nuclear, renewable energy news, events like this, actions, sign this letter. I circulate groups in this room, their information as well. If you would like to be added to my No Nukes newsletter, you need to give me your email separately. Just come up and sign a piece of paper. I'm sorry, I don't have my sign up board oh, here. Sign up sheet going around well, you know, can I suggest that you just send automatically a free copy to all these people and ask them if they want to sign up? Yeah, you can unsubscribe anytime. I'll just do that, I'll add you. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Kevin Camps, and he's with Beyond Nuclear. I've known Kevin for real, going on 25 years. Uh, I was a mentor to Kevin for a number of years, but the student is now the master, and he's wow. going to be speaking about nukes in the Great Lakes Basin and beyond. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Angela. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, yeah, so it's an honor to be invited to speak here. I wanted to mention uh, what the main reactor speak refers to. There's this really excellent book from the early 1980s called Nuke Speak that has been updated after Fukushima began. Um, it's really worth reading because what it's about, uh, Michael Keegan mentioned yesterday that the atom has subverted science and also the atom has subverted democracy. Well, the atom has also subverted language, uh, whether it be English or French. And that's what we're referring to with reactor speak. It's Orwellian. So I'm going to try to cheat on machine, my machine here. Okay, so it's been mentioned before, but the Great Lakes, which will be the focus of my talk, the beyond hopefully will come out more in the discussion. We already heard about the Canada side of the Great Lakes, but just to keep in mind that we're, we're talking about 21% of the world's surface fresh water in the Great Lakes, 84% of North America's, and it's the drinking water supply for 40 million people in the United States and Canada and a large number of Native American First Nations. Irreplaceable. Oh, there it is. And uh, this is a map by Irene Koch and Dave Martin, who we have tragically lost way too soon, from 1990. That was the state of affairs on the Great Lakes back then. And we were uh, blessed to have it updated by Anna Tillman of International Institute of Concern for Public Health with the support of uh, John Jackson. And it shows uh, that things have just grown worse since 1990. And Angela did a great job talking about the Canadian reactors. There's more than just reactors on the Great Lakes. In fact, every stage of the uranium fuel chain is present on the Great Lakes. It may be minor by comparison to other places, but we'll talk more about the mines and the mills and the waste dumps in future sessions here. Right now, we're talking about the reactors themselves. So. Um, I'll be flying through these slides because I have 15 minutes all together, and uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. So you can see Lake Michigan and Lake Huron being at the same elevation above sea level and connected through the Straits of Mackinac. They're one lake. And there is some flow. Um, it's, it's controversial, but there is flow from Lake Huron direction into Lake Michigan. Most people assume it's just the one direction, but it's not. Some good news to begin with. Kalani um, Atomic Reactor in northeast Wisconsin, south of Green Bay, shut down uh, in spring of 2013, very unexpectedly. It had a 20-year license extension. The US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is as bad as the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, has rubber-stamped some 75 uh, reactor license extensions in the United States. Kalani was one of them. All of a sudden, it declared, we are shutting down like now. Why? because it can't compete with some of those competitors that Angela mentioned. Uh, wind power is much less expensive source of electricity than even these old atomic reactors that long ago paid off their mortgage complements of the public, whether it was ratepayers or taxpayers paying all the bills for the nuclear industry, paying off the mortgage. 
just the operations and maintenance costs of old atomic reactors are more expensive than new wind that's coming in. And of course, we are no friends of fracking. We chanted, what did we say? No, no nukes, no coal, no, no fracking way yesterday in the march. We are no friends of fracking. Fracking is radioactive, for one thing. Um, it's a global warming uh, culprit. Poisons the groundwater. Fracking electricity from natural gas also outcompeted Kalani in the shutdown. Another monster on the western side of Lake Michigan is Point Beach units one and two. I'll be very brief. I mean, the list of problems with these reactors is very long. And you could full-time job for an army of people watchdogging each of these reactors. One of the top safety risks at Point Beach Unit 2 is that it is one of the worst embrittled reactor pressure vessels in the United States. It means the neutron radiation coming off the chain reaction in the core has poked microscopic holes in the 8-inch thick reactor pressure vessel walls. And if they ever activate the emergency core cooling system in an emergency and overheating of the core to try to prevent a meltdown, that thermal shock combined with the pressure, because in a pressurized water reactor like Point Beach Unit 2, you have pressure in the core of a ton per square inch, if you can believe that. It's what keeps the cooling water in liquid form at temperatures of 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. That cold water going into the core could punch a hole through the reactor pressure vessel wall. If you can imagine that, uh, punch a hole at a flaw along a crack all the way through eight inches of steel. Out goes the cooling water supply as steam, and there is no contingency. You will have a reactor core meltdown. The only question is, will the containment hold? And we saw at Fukushima Daiichi a different design, a boiling water reactor, that containments can be destroyed and release their content. How old is that? Point Beach Unit 2 is approximately 40 plus years old. Most of these reactors are either 35 years old, 40 years old, some are 45 years old. They're geriatric. So another piece of good news, Zion Units 1 and 2 shut down in 1998, 30 miles north of Chicago. All told, we are halfway to our reactor-free Lake Michigan because half the reactors have been shut down. These two shut down in 1998. They were the last shutdowns in the United States until Kiwani. We had a 15-year dry spell where reactors were operating away with known safety risks. And finally, in 2013, we broke that bad record. So Zion is shut down. One thing to mention about Zion is it is the largest decommissioning in US history. Exelon gave the job over to Energy Solutions of Utah, formerly called EnviroCare. Speaking of Orwellian, this nuclear dump company is called EnviroCare. Energy Solutions, west of Salt Lake City, a square mile of West Utah desert near the Skull Valley Ghost Chutes Indian Reservation. Tooele County, Utah is called a toxic industry zone. That's the official name. They're dumping the Class A out there for sure. Probably other categories. Some of them may be going to waste control specialists in Texas that Leona mentioned earlier. The biggest nuclear decommissioning in US history, and like Angela said about some of the Canadian Shenanigans, there is no financial auditing whatsoever on this billion dollar pot of money. There is no independent auditing. And Nuclear Energy Information Service of Chicago has hooted and hollered at every level, the governor's office, the attorney general's office. Give me a break, a billion dollars? Energy Solutions will do a very shallow cleanup, sending it out west, dumping it, and then they own the dump and then pocket the remainder if they can get away with it. And as we saw in New York State recently, the Public Service Commission in New York just handed over, all told, $8.3 billion of New York ratepayer money to the nuclear industry, Exelon, which has reactors in upstate New York we'll talk about. This is, uh, this is high crime. This is high crime in a financial sense, except there's no laws prohibiting it. So we're going to have to get real busy and stop this stuff. A thing I'll say about Cook Units 1 and 2 in Southwest Michigan is, like Angela said, um, when a reactor lacks cooling towers, it is dumping all of its waste heat into the surface water. So Cook, giant reactors, they're over 1,000 megawatts each. They're very old, they're 40 years old. They're a strange design, it's called an ice condenser reactor. Originally, the design was to be floated on a barge, and the idea was to move the barge around from city to city, wherever the electricity was needed, where they could get the best price. But the reason they built it on land, on the Lake Michigan shore, was they could save so much money. It's a very thin-shelled containment. It had to be on a barge. You could only make it so heavy, right? 
They saved all this money, very thin shell. It is the pressurized water reactor equivalent of Fukushima. Fukushima is a boiling water reactor. It's called pressure suppression containment. The ice is the pressure suppression. It's very thin shelled. It's got a pressure suppression containment, which means the containment is too small and too weak, and the pressure has to be suppressed, or it will destroy the containment. That's the risk at this place. But it lacks cooling towers. It dumps two thirds of the heat that it generates, just like any coal plant, any nuclear plant, dumps two thirds of the heat that it generates into the surface water as waste. Only a third of the heat is transformed into electricity. It's hugely inefficient. You are devastating the ecosystem. Uh, indigenous species can't survive in this hot water. Uh, invasive species can, some of them. It's just not good. Palisades Atomic Reactor, it's where I got started in this crazy line of work. Um, it's near my hometown of Kalamazoo. It is the worst embrittled reactor pressure vessel in the country. It is owned by Entergy Nuclear Corporation, which as the governor of Vermont, the legislative leaders of Vermont are fond of saying is a rogue corporation. And Chris Williams is here from Vermont Citizens Action Network. The people of Vermont convinced their elected officials to run this company out of the state and shut down Vermont Yankee. They are a rogue corporation. They got caught lying under oath to the state of Vermont times 12. Arnie Gunderson helped out that. Uh, the day, the place where it happened under oath to Vermont state officials and they are, they're crooks. And they're operating this very dangerous 45-year-old reactor called Palisades on Lake Michigan Shore. Some more good news, another one of these shutdowns on Lake Michigan, Big Rock Point up north. This is what's left, five minutes. <clears throat> what's left there, the reactor's gone, all the facilities are gone, they were shipped to various places, South Carolina for dumping in an African-American community. What's left is the high-level radioactive waste. Big Rock was an experimental reactor, only 70 megawatts electric, 1 15th the size of one of the Cook reactors. They were experimenting up there with plutonium fuel. They broke fuel rods in the core. They had huge releases to the environment. There's thyroid uh, disease up there. There's an epidemic of various diseases that have been known for 40 years. They do not officially exist. The authorities will not recognize them. It's more than anecdotal. Uh, Dr. Gerald Drake and his wife, Martha Drake, in the mid-1970s, she's a statistician with a University of Michigan degree in statistics. He's a general practitioner. They saw so much disease walking through the door of their small family practice in Charlevoix, Michigan, that they took it upon themselves to do the health studies. <laughs> he's still living. He's in his mid-90s. Uh, he's a treasure. Uh, this is, none of this disease is recognized by the US government, the state of Michigan. That's the high level waste you see there, just a few containers. And we'll talk more in the next session about the waste. These slides just show that even the, the air shed, if there's a disaster in the Great Lakes, it will fall on the waters of the Great Lakes. You don't have to be right on the shores. Arnie did a great presentation in Quebec City at that conference uh, about down, downstream. You know, if there's a disaster on the shoreline, it's going right in the lakes. If there's a disaster in the air shed, it's going in the lakes. The synergisms of fossil fuels and nuclear power are to be worried about in a big way. Some of the biggest coal burners in the country are on the Great Lakes. And then Angela has already talked about the Canadian reactors. Uh, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring warned about the synergisms between radioactivity, at the time bomb pest fallout, but now from nuclear power, and other hazards like pesticides. They, they complement each other in a bad way. We don't even know how that works completely. Some other reactors on Lake Erie's shore, Fermi 1 had a meltdown 50 years ago this October 5th. And there will be events in Southeast Michigan commemorating this near miss. We almost lost Detroit. Tim brought the book up yesterday. It's a great read. Fermi 2, the biggest Fukushima Daiichi twin design in the world. It's as big as Fukushima Daiichi units one and two put together with vastly more high level radioactive waste in its storage pool. It's had a bad run the last couple of years, a dozen breakdowns. Fermi-3 is a proposed new reactor we've been fighting now for eight years. Um, you know, when reactors are brand new, they have problems too. Three Mile Island, Unit 2 was brand new when it had its meltdown. Chernobyl, Unit 4 was brand new. They have bugs that get worked out in bad ways sometimes. So we gotta stop new reactors in the Great Lakes. And we've, we've done that, we did it at Darlington. They are not gonna build those new reactors. People are fighting them too hard. I believe it's gonna be stopped. That Fermi-3 as well. Davis Bessie, uh, a reactor that's had more near misses with catastrophe than any reactor in the United States, 
and now we now know lacks a containment structure. It is, it's concrete shield building is severely cracked, and every time it freezes, the cracking grows worse by a half inch. Every time it freezes, a dozen times a year or more. We're, we're thinking the shield building is going to collapse from its own weight at some point. You got research reactors in the Great Lakes like the NASA research reactors at Plum Brook, uh, Sandusky, Ohio, on the Lake Erie shoreline. Perry, Ohio, um, a problem there is uh, they don't seem to care about worker radiation exposure. They have an infamous record of overexposing their workers. Uh, Angela talked about all these Canadian reactors. Uh, upstate New York, some very bad news last week. The governor of New York, a Democrat, Governor Andrew Cuomo, as I mentioned, forked over $7.6 billion to Exelon Nuclear, headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. It's an out-of-state company. New York rate their money to prop up four old reactors on the uh, Lake Ontario shoreline, right across from Ontario. Nine million people get their drinking water out of Lake Ontario. You've got Guinea, Exelon owned. You've got Nine Mile Point, Units 1 and 2, Exelon owned. Again, 40-year-old reactors. Fitzpatrick, formerly Energy owned, being bought for pennies on the dollar by Exelon, so that it can access these subsidies, compliments of the people of New York, uh, electricity bills are now going to have a surcharge, a tax on them to prop up these reactors that can't compete economically. They're very dangerous reactors. This is radioactive Russian roulette. Governor Andrew Cuomo owns them now, so to speak. The other $700 million that makes it an $8.3 billion handover of public money is the decommissioning fund at Fitzpatrick, which the state of New York, New York Power Authority, the people of New York controlled they would have some control on this decommissioning fund. He just gave it to Exelon Nuclear as a uh, sweetener on the deal. It's, it's insane. It's crazy. So there's Quebec, and that's it. Okay, next we're going to hear from uh, Arnie Gunderson. It'll take a minute to get set up on the laptop, or maybe it's ready to go. So as you can see, there, there are 37 reactors right in the watershed, but another 23 just out of the watershed that would impact the windshed. So 60 reactors are threatening 21% of the world's surface fresh water, most precious resource on the planet. Um. Do you have it on a stick? Because if you have no, it on a stick, you can use this laptop. Here's a call. If a little rough, it will be the same. Mm -hmm. But that's, is it a man? Yeah, okay. Yeah. There you go. Okay, there we go. I don't know if you've got contact. All right, it's rough. Yeah, there it goes. Good. <laughs> Downstream, uh, you can go up on the Fairwinds website, and it talks about the fact that Fukushima is a disaster, and it's an insult to the Pacific. But the Pacific's a pretty big place, so by the time it gets to California, it's only perhaps you know, about 10 disintegrations per second in a cubic meter, and about this by this by this. So if you we're watching it every time a disintegration occurred, you have a little spark of light. That would be uh, in that three by three by three space. You'd see 10 sparks of light every second. And that would go on for 30 years, and then it would be down to five specks of light. And then eventually, after three or 400 years, there'd be none left. But the Pacific is a big place. The Great Lakes are 30,000 times smaller. So if we had a Daiichi accident on one of the 40 nukes that border the Great Lakes, the concentration in St. Lawrence, in, you know, that which, which Montreal relies on or Quebec relies on, would be 30,000 times higher. You would have to abandon Montreal, Quebec, Detroit, 
on uh, all of the cities along the uh, along the river. Yes. I just wanted to mention that our Kandu reactors are about uh, 2,400 times more tritium is dumped into those lakes than a light water reactor because we use heavy water to moderate and sustain the fissioning. So the density is about that much greater and the consequences is that we get that much more tritium dumped into the lake. They separate some of it, but not well, and the other thing Gordon's explained to me that the, the candy reactor has more zircaloy per pound of, of, of per, per megawatt output than any American reactor. And zircaloy is the thing that burns in air hydroporically. Uh, so if there is an accident in the candy plant, um, it would be worse than Fukushima if that's, if that's even possible. But I wanted to talk about that concept. This was part of a longer slide presentation I gave in Japan. Um, this concept of, when, when, when I went to school, we were told dilution is the solution to pollution. And um, it's not. So what I'm starting with here is a cube. Uh, thank you. Is that right? Is a cube that's 10 units by 10 units by 10 units. And um, what, that, what that means is 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. And I did it because I, I, I think in REM, the new term is Sieverts, but we'll, I'll make that some version of REM. So that's 1,000 REM. So if I had this cube of 10 by 10 by 10, and, and I gave it to Bob, he would die. 1,000 REM kills someone, 100% sure. OK, so let's dilute it. That's the plan. Instead of 10 by 10 by 10, let's make it 10 by 10 by 1. So now, instead of 1,000 rem, it's 100 rem. Or it turns out to be one sievert. And I'll try to convert for it. So now, if I gave each one of those pancakes to 10 people, one person would die. I don't know who. But I know that as I reduce the amount of radiation, the same, a person is going to die, but it becomes diluted and you just don't know who. So this is 10 by 10 by 1. And now we cut it again. So now, instead of 10 by 10 by 1, it's 1 by 10, right, or 100 milliseconds. And I'd have 100 of them. So I gave them out to 100 people. Somebody in that group would die. 99 people would not. Somebody in that group would die. And the last slide, of course, is 1 cube. If I gave that out to 1,000 people, Somebody in that group would die. Now, at Fukushima, there are hundreds of thousands of these big cubes. So when we throw all those big cubes into the Pacific and dilute it out, we know hundreds of thousands of those big cubes are going to kill somebody, are going to kill hundreds of thousands of people. But when we throw them into the Pacific and dilute it out, the net effect is still the same. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. We just don't know who. And that's what the people in the nuclear industry count on. They'll dilute that out over all of the countries that surround the Pacific Rim. And epidemiologically, it will be incredibly difficult to say that your cancer came from Fukushima and other people's cancer came from whatever. And so the, the ploy here that's occurring in the process is that the, uh, the scientific community knows that when you dilute these tens of thousands of cubes or hundreds of thousands of, of cubes of radiation down, you will be killing people in the Pacific Basin. But you just won't know. 
So I've been saying for years now that somewhere between 100,000 and, and a million people will die from cancer from, um, from Fukushima Daiichi. And the nuclear industry will say, man, eh, maybe a couple thousand. But the difference is that they know, it's called linear non-threshold, they know that uh, there's no safe limit below which radiation doesn't cause cancer. But they also know it's incredibly difficult to prove that a cancer was caused by Daiichi versus a, a cancer that, that someone would be uh, routinely expected to handle. So I use this visual as an example of that cube is sure to kill you. When you cut it tenfold, one of 10 will, one of 100 will, one of 1,000 will. But when you have hundreds of thousands of those cubes and you're throwing them into the Pacific, sooner or later there will be hundreds of thousands of cancer fatalities. And the Great Lakes, because they're 30,000 30, times smaller, would magnify that. You can't dilute it in the Great Lakes. And you'd wind up having to evacuate 40, 50 million people who rely on the Great Lakes for their social work. Okay, I'm done. We've got uh, 20 minutes uh, for questions and answers and further discussions. If somebody has a cameo example they want to provide, or if they have uh, um, questions for other people. Uh, okay, I've got three hands. We would handle it. Are you saying one? How many thousand deaths do you predict from Fukushima? I said uh, all of a hundred thousand and a high number. And that would take decades to. Yeah, over thirty years. You know, the, yeah, the, you know, the, the other advantage the nuclear industry has is that that there are no bodies in the street on the very first day. But there will be, over time, something on the order of 100,000 to a million cancer fatalities. Well, do you have any other questions? Yeah, are we, are, are, have you, has anyone ever, can, can, can someone do a similar uh, demonstration with like the plutonium coming from Los Alamos? Because oh, the same, the, the same concept applies. You know, uh, a thousand rem, or 10 sieverts is going to kill someone. And as you cut it, you, you spread that dose out, but it doesn't mean that there's not a fatality at the, at the end of the line. That, that, that box that gets cut, 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 conceptually that applies to any case, you know, Church Rock, Three Mile Island, any of them. Yeah. Thanks. All right, there'll be Chris, question then we'll go to you. Angela, I have a question for you about uh, do you know what the excess capacity estimate is like? Okay, I have it in one of these reports. Okay, I can report it in my book. Okay, I got another one. <laughs> I, I know you're gonna do a um, uh, a presentation on the proposal level dump on Lake Huron. But is that at the Bruce site? Is that where we're going? Yes. Okay, so it's on the same footprint. Yeah. yeah. Idiots. <laughs> when um, former Ontario Energy Minister Bob Shirelli signed that secret deal, he said that there were off ramps. Do you know? Do we know anything about those? Well, I I think the deal with the off, there are off ramps with both the Darlington contract and the Bruce contract, and I think. With the Darlington contract, we can we can get out of each reactor. Maybe it's with the Bruce contract; it, they would get two reactors built before we could pull out. Mm -hmm. I, something about that, but but the taxpayers would probably have a big penalty to, to pay. Well, the way they've worked it in the contract is that there wouldn't be those big penalties, like that we can actually. If, but it becomes more complicated because we've signed a contract for six. But uh, they've designed it such that with the off-ramps, it's not like having to pay to buy out of a contract with a corporation. But are the deal, are the details of those contracts still secret, basically? Yeah, in fact, we tried to get the details of those contracts through Freedom of Information, and we got uh, redacted contracts. You should talk to Jack about that and mm. see what more he knows. 
We have a question over here. So one million more out of 50, you're talking about a 2% increase in the amount of cancer. And uh, epidemiologically, that's hard to tease out of the data. Um, but, of course, within Fukushima Prefecture, it'll be much greater in proportion to Okinawa, for instance. So um, good epidemiologists will be able to pull the, the information out of the data. Another problem that's happened in Fukushima, though, is that the doctors are lying. Um, we had a, uh, uh, I met with a doctor who was uh, put out of business. Whenever he would diagnose someone with a radiation illness, the Japanese refused to pay the bill. If he put stress, they'd pay the bill. So he closed his, he had to close his, his practice. We had a, a, a woman who came to me. She had lost her hair, had nosebleeds for two months, and had speckles all over her body, and the doctor told her it was stress. And so uh, epidemiologically, when you go back and you look at these health records, they're being distorted by the medical community, and um, it will be more difficult to, we're also not getting any data out of Fukushima Prefecture for the last five years. They haven't published any of their stillbirths, any of their spontaneous abortions, none of that, uh, as well as any of their um, uh, fatality. So we just are not getting information out of the main prefecture that we should be looking at. Yeah. It's, it will be difficult because the inhumanity of the Japanese government toward its own people is pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, uh, and Michael, yep. Michael yeah. 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 Uh, background radiation at Fukushima, that's measurable. And outlying areas, you can measure background radiation. There is a difference. Uh, we need a real good yardstick, and I think we can get it. I would like to know what background radiation was in 1943, before all this fissioning start, because then we can have a gradient to say, look, what's happening? You know, we had the nuclear atmospheric testing came and it went. But this stuff keeps going up. So, mm -hmm. but that's a good point. I yeah, I I, this is before the fishing started. Then we can, we can, really identify the culprit. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but I might just add that uh, one of the problems with um, you see, like, imagine uh, you have a mass murder. It goes shooting people, killing, strangling, whatever. Um, statistically, it's insignificant if you consider the whole population, and you just have a, a few extra deaths, except they happen to be murders. Now, in the case of murder, you can usually use ballistics to show it was a rifle, or use the strangulation to show that somebody did it. With radiation, uh, the trouble is you don't have those telltale signs. So all you know is that people are dying, but you can't tell who they are, and there's no way of identifying the victims if you don't measure the radiation dose they receive. And that's the problem, is that we do not have a measurement of the radiation dose these people are receiving. With workers, you have an idea. You can, you can give pretty good estimates of what uranium miners are being exposed to. Or workers in a nuclear plant, they're measuring the radiation dose. But with the population, nobody is measuring the radiation dose they're actually getting. And that makes it extra difficult, again, to prove these things. But if you look at it in a global yes. way, yeah. 1943 background radiation, yeah. and then radiation now, the only barrier between what's inside our skin and outside is our skin. We still ingest it, we breathe it in. Yes, it's no matter. I do yeah. know that there are many citizens groups all over Japan who have bought their own equipment and who have set up their own um, measurement station because we all know that the government will just put random, very underestimated measures <laughs> on their measurement posts. So I just wanted to say that people are trying to gather our information for you. Know. 
Kevin's got an example here. Um, there's a, a group of Japanese women in New York City who live there. And after 3-11-11, after they held educational um, presentations. And I met a woman named Tomoi Zimmer in New York City. And just like you said, she and her sisters who still live in Osaka, whose children are in Osaka, who go to school there, they bought their own uh, state-of-the-art um, equipment to test the radioactivity levels in food. And they donated it to the elementary school where their own daughters went. But all of the children at that one school were protected in that way because there's so much deception going on by the Japanese government and even exports to other countries in Asia and other places where food from Fukushima was not labeled as such. And uh, they were, like you said, they were, they were protecting their own children and their neighbor's children with, with this equipment that they paid for themselves. I think it was $15,000. They got it from Ukraine. Why does Ukraine have such equipment? Because of Chernobyl. So. And the, the problem, the other problem in Japan is that the, we found a piece of nuclear fuel 300 miles away. And, and it was microscopic. It was uh, literally six nanometers, of, of six millionths of a meter. But that little tiny particle was given off 200 disintegrations every second, 200 radioactive decay. And that's in people's lungs. Yes. And it's small enough that it's not going to get detected by a, by a detector, but it's an internal exposure, a lung, a liver, or whatever, that over time will cause a necrosis and, and, and a cancer. Um, and uh, one of the, I'm, I'm working on a paper with some professors at Worcester Poly as a result of the trip I took. And we were finding a large number of these very large, very highly radioactive particles um, in vacuum cleaner bags. We're asking people in Japan to mail us their vacuum cleaner bags. And as they, if it's, a, if it's on the floor in their homes, it's in their lungs. And over time, we'll begin to see lung cancers, liver cancers, and, and things like that, which is unfortunate. But to my Japanese friends, if you send us a vacuum cleaner bag, we would be very grateful. And I, I can send you instructions later. And that, that ingestion in the lungs, we have an excellent photograph, or one of Robert's yes. photographs, Robert next door, of an ape lung that has plutonium on it. And you can see the pattern. I think it's 48 hour exposure. Um, so we got a perfect example of what Arnie's talking about. People adjusted that. And were those those radioactive fleas? Was that yeah. that fuel rod? Yeah. Was that fuel flea? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, the fuel flea. Fuel flea. Okay. All right. Um, how are we doing on time? We got another question here. Um, I tried to I I was wondering if you know how to determine the very long term effects. Uh, internal contamination has on population and their uh, progenitsu, their descendants. Uh, from what, from the, from the little I read from Chernobyl, I think the, the, uh, the uh, chromosomic aberrations don't fix themselves. I think we have a mechanism to fix chromosomic aberration, but after a, a while, I, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but after uh, above a certain threshold, the body is overwhelmed by radioactivity, and these mis these aberrations are being passed to the ne next generation, uh, logically. But I don't know to which extent that occurs. So I I wonder if it, if we have if we know and if how do we know and if if so what what is the observed effect over generations, like if. The dose that won't kill immediately over a generation, what does it create? Does it help? That's, I have some. Gordon has some. That, that, that's a very, very good question and very difficult. And uh, the answer, the short answer is we really do not have a good handle, uh, especially for humans. They have, they have done a lot of genetic experiments with other creatures of all kinds, from the insects to mammals to birds and so on. And they have determined genetic changes, genetic damage uh, with these species. But with humans, it's very difficult to do this. And when the nuclear authorities calculate the damage from a curtain radiation dose to workers, they estimate only genetic damage to the first two generations. 
the children and the grandchildren, because they say after that it doesn't affect the worker. So if it doesn't affect the worker, then it doesn't have to be counted. So yes, uh, obviously we, 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 uh, this is an important consideration that genetic damage does get carried on and nobody really has a good handle on how to estimate the long-term consequences of that. I recall a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Judith Johnson, gave a lecture in 1992 in Toledo, Ohio, and she plotted out, she talked about genotype and phenotype. The genetic damage has occurred, our current population has got that genetic damage, and we're carrying it forward, and there will be more and more. So the, the, as she graphed it out, it's curvilinear. The damage to our genetic pool may have already been done irreparably. And earlier today, we heard about the, the Laplanders and the reindeer and the, the, the collapse of the reindeer population. So what the point you bring up is right on spot our target. And I wonder if Dee might have something to add to that. She's a, a trained biologist, I believe. Or... Uh, well, the, it, it's known that radioactivity damages the genetic material. And so something that goes on it is not only that the genetic material is damaged now, so that and all of the genetic material for humans is in our bodies right now. This is it for the future of our species. So the damage that's done is being done. And the other thing that is going on simultaneously is as we contaminate our environment with long-lasting radioactivity, then we're also continuing these children that are born, who are children are more susceptible anyway, um, they're also then exposed to more radioactivity in the environment, so it's a very large experiment. And Dr. Johnsrud, who uh, Michael mentioned, she called it the thickening of the radiation environment. Um, humans didn't evolve until the radiation in background went down on the planet, and now we're slowly increasing the amount of radioactivity by digging up the uranium and dispersing it and putting it into reactors and into bombs and deliberately releasing it. The goal of regulations should be to limit, to have a goal of zero. And instead, what's happening with every international and national agency is to increase the legal allowable contamination levels. As the industry ages and it gives off more radioactivity in order to just operate, and the reality is that they cannot isolate this from the environment. So what do the government agencies do is to increase the legal levels. And in the United States, we're now fighting um, a huge increase in allowable radioactivity in our drinking water. Um, they want to allow, in some cases, thousands and millions of times more radioactivity in the drinking water legally. So uh, I know I'm getting off track from your question, but the question is, what is the damage? And Gordon was carefully saying, well, we don't know exactly what it is, but we know for damn sure it's happening. Yeah. And we haven't quantified it. And by the time we quantify it, it's, it's already too late. So the goal needs to be to force the agencies to move toward uh, stopping releases. Okay. Um, uh, Kevin wanted to say a word about uh, Belarus. Uh, but Bob's got a question first. And then we'll call the gentleman from Japan. Uh, and we'll start the next workshop in about five minutes. Uh, I once interviewed Alice Stewart, who did the childhood uh, cancer survey that determined that uh, x-rays to a pregnant woman increased uh, very much uh, leukemia. And uh, this- In the children. In the baby. In, in children, yeah. in the baby, in the fetus. And she said, what we're doing is, uh, you know, we couldn't evolve until radiation levels subsided. But now that we're adding radiation to the market, we're going backwards in terms of evolution. And she said that the planetary level of radiation is about 5% greater than it was before the bomb. And uh, just every year it's going. And I want to follow up on that because when I first got to Nuclear Information Resource Service 30 years ago, I was saying, okay, what was background back then? Well, it turns out that they didn't have that much instrumentation to measure it. And all the instruments that they had were over in the Marshall Islands when they were doing bomb testing on the poor Marshallese and the Bikini Islands. And that's where all the instruments were. And actually, when they were doing those tests, they had to hold off for some reason. And then the instruments all went back to the universities where they were. And they weren't there at the time of some of the tests. I mean, it was a 
physically a limitation on the amount of instrumentation that there was to do the measuring. And so we may not really know what it was way back when. Well, I think they can ascertain it. Yes, they do do measurements, particularly as Alamos and stuff, because they had to gauge their equipment, you know, mm -hmm. to test increases. So they had to have some agreed upon. You know, right, in that location. Radiation. In that location, but it's well, different there everywhere. There were other places yes. that worked. There was Soap Ridge, there was uh, some in uh, Hanford, and there was up north, you know, England, all of them were in on this. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a number that can be reasonably gotten. And then as we will have a kind of a yardstick, but it just say, gee, this is going up every year. We're moving in the wrong direction. This isn't creation anymore. We're decreating. Is that what we're doing? De evolution. Okay. We're going to move, be transitioning to the next uh, program, which will be on nuclear waste forevermore. And we're fortunate mm -hmm. to have a gentleman from, from Japan who would Toshio like to talk. Yana Yihara? Okay. Yana Yihara. Who, who will be presenting uh, with his data. Uh, but in that transition, as he comes on up forward, Kevin Camps has a few words to say about Belarus. Yeah. Did you have something? I saw your hand. Did you want to? I just wanted to ask a very separate question. Very random, but um, from, I just wanted to ask, because we have different um, people of different ages, different you know, origins, people from Europe, North America, Asia, and we have different experiences with the past accidents and such, right? You have some turnover, for example, but I was in the so I don't know. If you were to eat Japanese food, what would your safe limit be? Would you feel comfortable eating rice from California, for example? Would you go to Japan and eat sushi? Would that one-time dose be acceptable for your standards for your own health or for your children? Or what would you think is a cutoff? Like, let's say, would you eat shano mushrooms from Korea. <laughs> yeah. So, interestingly enough, Japan's food safety standards for radioactivity are much stronger than ours in the United States and in Canada. The current limit in Japan is 100 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cesium in food. So, Arnie mentioned the flashes, the disintegrations per second. So, in Japan, the legal limit for radioactivity in food is 100 becquerels, 100 radioactive disintegrations per second in a kilogram of food, 2.2 pounds. That's just the cesium, but it's, a, it's an indicator of how bad the contamination is. By way of comparison, in Canada, the limit is 1,000. It's 10 times worse. In the United States, it's 1,200. What that sets up under law, legally, is Japan can have food that is unfit for human consumption. It's more than 100 becquerels per kilogram. They can export it to North America, where it can be legally consumed. And I, I haven't studied this issue specifically in detail, but I would imagine that no labeling is required after a certain point. People in North America could easily be eating contaminated food from Fukushima and other prefectures, not know it, and be exposed to relatively high levels of radioactivity. That's the kind of deception and secrecy that goes on with these things. And I want to answer your question where you said, what's safe? There's no safe level. Every amount of ionizing radiation, whether it comes from Fukushima or the rocks or the sun, if it's ionizing radiation, it increases the risks of cancer and many other health effects. So the goal should be the minimum amount. And what the government sets as a legal level is not necessarily a safe level. So I'd like to make that distinction. They call it the Safe Drinking Water Act levels, but it doesn't mean that it's safe. At the Safe Drinking Water Act levels, one in 10,000 people will get cancer from that in the US. And then they increase those levels, then it will be more people. Yeah. So there's not a safe level. Yeah. Um, and then you don't really know how much there is uh, to actually make an informed judgment on how much is in the mushroom or how much is in the rice. So the thing to know is that the higher up the food chain, the more concentrated the radioactivity. So if you eat a really big fish, you get more radioactivity than a little fish. Okay, let me give us. Yeah, Gordon's got a quick point to make. One, one specific example. Very important to understand that the legal limit of radiation exposure has nothing to do with the health effects. It's an arbitrary amount. Here in Canada, they have a legal limit of radiation exposure for uranium miners that hasn't changed over the decades. The Atomic Energy Control Board, the regulatory agency, asked an independent 
epidemiology of science to study what would be the effects if workers worked at that level, it would amount to multiplying the lung cancer incidence by four. If workers were to work at that level year after year for their lifetime, it would be a four times the normal incidence of lung cancer. So this is by no means safe. And it, each legal limit has a, birth, has a health toll which is un, unrelated to the legality of the limit. So I, I just want to, it's important to realize that legal limits are not safe. Not here in Canada and not elsewhere either. which are way higher than other countries. And this is because our government has been the creator of the nuclear industry in Canada. There is no separation between the nuclear industry and the government in Canada. They are one and the same in many ways. And our, country, our governments also want to sell reactors to other countries. They want to sell uranium to other countries. And they have a vested conflict of interest in uh, setting those standards high so that they can always say, oh, we're way lower than the maximum allowed. So it's pre? Yes. So, so uh, do not use Canadian standards as a good example of safety. Not at all. They're very Okay, I'd like to bring up our, our friends from Japan to give a presentation. Uh, a very great discussion, great questions. Boy, my head's almost hurting, but we're going we're gonna to hear from our friends from Japan. Um, and then we'll hear from Oli Henderson about Chalk River, another nasty facility. And then Kevin Camps will be mopping up nuclear waste. Um, so this, this next workshop is on nuclear waste forevermore. Now what? Now what do we do with what is actually the product of the nuclear power industry? The product is nuclear waste to get plutonium ultimately and the byproduct is fleeting electricity. So uh, could we bring up our, our Japanese friends? And I believe uh, he'll have an interpreter. Um, could you introduce him? So that I'm going to 